Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Hi everyone and welcome to Common Ground. I'm your host, Ashley Hall. Common Ground captures the creative process of various artists living throughout our region. Each week we delve into the veiled history of our area, plus we take you inside the cultural events that put the North in North Country. On this week's episode of Common Ground, we visit Walker, Pine River, and Longville for the Lake Ada Art Crawl. Mary Therese Peterson, a fiber artist of Bemidji, shows us how she would rather wear her art than hang it. And Paul Jones, a bladesmith from Bemidji, shows us his craft step by step. The silk that I'm working on today is a bate silk. It's a china silk is another name for it. It's a very light six millimeters in thickness. And um, it's very light and breezy silk, uh, almost see-through. I'm going to be using the tajanting. And this is a tool that has a little handle and a little cup and the cup scoops up the wax, and, and then it has a little spout that allows the wax to drip out of the edge of it. So what I've already drawn, some little semicircles that I'm gonna work within to do my designs. I've got a little format to be within a certain space. So I kinda have to keep the, the tool moving in order for the flow of the line to be consistent. Scoop up some more hot wax. And then figure out where I want to start. More of a solid line. As I draw now, this is just totally like automatic drawing <laughs> where, you know, I've, I've always spent lots of time drawing birds and fish. And so this project, a lot of times I plan out a design and sometimes I just kind of go with the flow where I just, it's what I call gestural abstraction. So it's, an abstract of a bird, but it's kind of gestural lying, real free form lines. Wherever the wax is, it's going to be a white line. And it will also control the, the bleeding of the dyes. So when I paint the dye inside the shape, it will bleed up to the edge of that line. Unless there's a break in the line, it will stay on this side of the wax, the dyes. This is a concentrated dye where it just has the, the, um, the dye particles mixed with water. And so what I do to activate it is mix it with urea, which is the chemical that allows the liquid dye to stay wet longer. I'm just going to go in to my shapes and get a sense of how thick the dye is. It's thick enough to, that it's not spreading, it's not seeping, bleeding, but instead it's staying where I paint it. After this is all done, I'll actually roll it up in paper and put it into my steamer over on the stove. And that's how you set the dyes, by steaming it for 40 minutes. So this is wearable art and it's a, a, a great thing to be able to make some art that people love to wear. So it's a new, it's a new thing for me, um, getting off the wall and onto, onto people and into windows. But the silk has such a translucent quality. I just love how the light passes through it. So it's a lot like stained glass. This method of this automatic writing is just 
I just love doing it. It's so meditative and I just kind of lose myself in it. And especially with working with the wax, just love to watch the wax flow. I like to experiment and allow things to reveal themselves to me. I'm working free form like this. But I'll keep adding layers as they dry. I'll add layers of color. And then, um, and then I can go back, actually, after the, the dye is dry and add more wax over top of some of these shapes. I've always enjoyed um, working with the figure. And so I'm, right now I'm in that stage of my life where I want to take what I've gained and kind of try to loosen up and become more gestural and free and I'm experimenting more and trying to find new ways to approach the, um, the surface. I spent lots of years trying to be, approach the, um, a drawing in a really real, realistic manner and so now I'm trying to hold on to that gestural quality where things I just allow it to come from more the unconsciousness and the, um, and the lines just lead me and, and so I'm, I'm learning, it's, it's like a different form of learning when you just allow your hand to move through space and you, you have a thought in mind but you're not studying something outside of your, your free flowing imagination. And so, like, like this bird right here, to me, this is just magical how it came about, you know, and the the way it bled and the and the, the freedom of the line. And it wasn't premeditated in any way that it just it came from the end of my hand. I think there's really something wonderful about getting away from art on the wall, and that's a, a art that you can wrap yourself in it or, and put it in the window and have light come through it and it can have a function other than just hanging on the wall. Did you find the
I'm Paul Jones. My wife and I own Deepwood Ventures. We make uh, wood carving knives, hunting knives, and carving tools. Uh, we've been doing it since about 2005 as a result of, uh, of me making carving tools all my life, being a wood carver and wanting for a better tool. I've been making my wood carving tools since I was a teenager. My dad would bring home uh, mechanical hacksaw blades and I would make wood carving tools from those hacksaw blades. So technically I've been making them since a teen I was a teenager. But along about 2002, 2003, I pulled all of my carving knives out of my carving bag and decided that some of them had to go. So I sharpened them up, polished them up, and I put them on eBay. And I got a pretty good response. And before I knew it, I had folks calling me from all over the United States saying, well, can you make one like you, the one you sold on May 17th? And I got a lot of orders that way. So I decided to go formal, and put my website up, put a, put a website up and uh, start selling them full time. Uh, I developed a, a cadre or a, or a collection of knives that people like to use for wood carving and uh, that developed my patterns and uh, I've been going ever since. Typically in a week, uh, let's see, around Christmas time I made about uh, 90 to 100 a week and, and when it gets really slow and quiet in February, I'm down to maybe 10. Uh, but otherwise I'm pretty busy, I, I keep busy, I come out here after work each night and work for about four hours trying to keep up with my orders and try to get them out within the week. We sell all over the world. I've sold to uh, clients or to customers in Hungary, China, Sweden, all over Scandinavia, Ireland, England, um, Nova Scotia, Australia. Uh, some of my best customers are in Australia. And what amazes me is that there's some world-class bladesmiths in Sweden, Finland and Norway, and they also are some of my best customers. We started out with our drill rod, which is our annealed drill rod. We just ran through the forge and I pounded it to this form. Now for our next step, we're gonna grind that form into what looks like a nice wood carving blade. So I'm using a, a ceramic belt, which kind of sharpens itself as I go. And here we go with that. Now at this point of the grinding, we're not worried about the blue and about burning the, burning the steel. We're not really burning the steel, we're even bringing it into a more annealed state. Uh, if this was a heat treated blade, whereas it was hardened and tempered, the blade would be pretty much ruined, It'd be too soft. But we'll go through those, those processes next. We've rough ground the blade, uh, we've given it its rough angle, we've left the edge that's oh, about a th thick as a credit card maybe, a little under, and we'll, we'll be sharpening that down after heat treating. Now we're gonna heat treat our blades. I'm gonna turn this down just a little bit. We're running a little hot. Now this, is the, this is the more crucial part of the, of the knife making. We can get, bring all these to all these steps, and go through the process of grinding it, but of all the things that you have to do, this is probably the most important. This is where we have to make sure that the color is right and that, the, that it reaches uh, non-magnetic. That's when all the carbons and all the, all the alloys and steel is in solution, meaning that the carbons, carbon molecules and the, the, the iron molecules kind of mix together to make a nice hard steel blade to form what's called a, a martensite. Now, the reason that we want all these things to form in solution because they get really fine and then 
uh, it creates a fine green steel which makes for a fine green edge which makes for a fine fine edge which is ultimate for wood carving so we've got our steel at a nice bright orange now as you see as it cools down it starts to change color now when it reaches a certain darkness it starts to heat up again you can see where it's where it's moving from dark to light again now we want to try and hit that before it, it makes a change in color. So we've got nice bright orange. We're going to test it against the magnet. It's not sticking because it's just hot enough that nothing is in solution. But once it gets cooled down, it sticks. Bright orange, we're looking for that red. Here we go. Now we've gotten our blade out of the out of the um, quench, and it's hard right now. But the problem with it being hard is it's very brittle. We don't want it to be brittle because when we when it's too brittle, I can take it and snap it off pretty pretty easily and that's not what we want what we want so we have to have to temper it but before we temper it we make sure that everything got hard one way to test that is to take a take a known hardness which is a file uh, which is I've read it's about a 68 Rockwell which is a very hard piece of steel we're gonna run it across the and you can see how it's just taking the carburation off the top, but I can't really file on the steel. It, it won't cut it, it just skates off. We know we've gotten hard now. But in order to prevent that snapping part to happen, we're gonna stick it in a tempering oven and bake it. We're gonna do this three times. And what this does is it creates more of that martensite that we talked about before and makes a tougher blade, makes a finer edge blade and uh, stays sharp longer. And this is just a tougher blade for, for anybody to use. Now we've had it in our tempering oven for, for our three times at about 350 degrees in a sliding scale, which means it's, it's slowly cooled, slowly less time at the same temperature. Give us this nice dark bronze slightly purple, which uh, gives us the perfect hardness for hardness and flexibility for our blade. Now comes the polishing and sharpening part. Now of all, of all the processes, this probably takes long, long, the longest just in the fact of, of all the time spent at these wheels right here. First, we're gonna do a rough, do our final smooth grind on it. The same grind will give us our polish and our edge at the same time. We're down to our final grind and we've just ba basically started to form the blade. Now this final fine grind is a setup for the polishing of the blade. made our blade. It's got a pretty good polish on it right now, but we won't do a final polish till the blade gets installed into the handle. Most of the Deep Woods Ventures knives are made out of burl. You know what a burl is? It's a growth on the tree that's kind of a big wart on the tree. And what happens is, is the way this wart grows, it gives you some nice figure. got our handle and we've got our blade and what we're going to do is we're going to use a, that's a 
glorified epoxy super glue. I'm just going to put a couple drops in there. Now this super glue will hold several tons of force. We just slide it in here. You can see that's going to be a good tight fit. Just going to bring it up to that glue point and push it down. Check for straightness. Make a slight, slight adjustment. And now we're ready to go back and finish the handle. Okay, we've smoothed out the handle. You can see that wonderful birch flame green in there. Now comes the best part. We, we, uh, when I first started making carving knives, I wasn't putting a maker's mark on there. And a tool collector friend of mine says, well, you gotta put a maker's mark on there. And my maker's mark is a deer hoof, which is a deer track, would be a deer track on the handle. The reason it's a deer hoof is that I bought this the property in which we live on to deer hunt because I'm a bow hunter. And it turns out I'm not a very good bow hunter because all I see is deer hooves or deer tracks. So that's my maker's mark. What we're gonna do is we're gonna heat this iron up until it's nice and glowing, glowing orange, and make our maker's mark. So we've got our brand, oh, it's a little bit more orange hot. Now we get to put the maker's mark on there. We've put our finish on our handle. It's, nice, it's dried out and now comes the final sharpening. Uh, we've went back to the big gray wheel, run, run our sharpening across again. And now we test it. The idea of testing is to, most guys, when they test a knife, they, they shave the hair off their arms. Well, I don't have any hair on my arms anymore to shave, so uh, we're actually gonna test it on what we use it on. And when you test a wood carving knife to see if it's sharp, you're gonna wanna go across the end grain of a piece of basswood or the wood you're gonna carve. And it should be nice and clear should make that nice, nice wood carving, peeling potato sound. My favorite part is the constant improvement, the constantly trying to get better and refine one aspect of blade making, one half degree at a time, and then that makes me happy. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed the show and we look forward to seeing you next week right here on Common Ground. If you have a segment idea for Common Ground pertaining to North Central Minnesota, contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3022. To view this episode or any Common Ground segment, visit us at lptv.org backslash common ground. or copies of Common Ground, please call 218-333-3020. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org. If you have segment ideas pertaining to North Central Minnesota, contact us at legacy at lptv.org. Common Ground is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund by the vote of the people on November 4th, 2008.